Today's episode of the Restoration Today podcast is brought to you by Encircle. Encircle is an all-in-one field documentation platform that puts critical field data at your fingertips and in high-quality reports, streamlining your operations from first call to completion certificate so you can grow your revenue, increase profitability, and get paid sooner. Encircle recently introduced a new feature called Hydro to make restorative drying simple. Find out more at getencircle.com. Hey there, thanks for checking out the latest episode of the Restoration Today podcast. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Justin Woodard as they celebrate their 75th anniversary. uh, Justin is the CEO and president of Woodard Cleaning and Restoration in St. Louis. Um, Justin, thank you very much for joining me. This is a big monumental celebration and milestone here. So congratulations on that. Can you take a moment to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the background of Woodard? Sure, Michelle. Thank you very much for uh, having me on this morning. Um, it's uh, it's exciting to talk to you and uh, uh, get a little opportunity to share, you know, who what it is and why we exist. Um, yeah. I am. Um, I think I, I think I'd best be able to kind of introduce myself as someone who's really passionate about people. Um, I've been working at Woodard uh, full time for about fourteen years now, and um, the thing that that uh, that I've focused on more than anything is. How do we actually create this environment where our people uh, can uh, thrive, uh, where they can grow, uh, and uh, where they can kind of become the people that they are meant to be? Um, and you know, I, I believe in order if we do that, they will be able to go out and help our customers uh, for all of the needs that they have that we can help them with, uh, and be able to you know kind of maintain that reputation uh, and you know quality service that. That Woodard is known for uh, to be able to bring that to people all over St. Louis and you know in some cases uh, around the country. Perfect. All right. So so tell me about the roots of Woodard a little bit. Like you've been around for seventy five years. So how many generations in are you? How did it start? Was it a carpet cleaning company? Was it something else? How, how did it get its start? Yeah, Woodard uh, was started uh, by my grandparents Earl and Nancy Woodard. Uh, so I that makes me the third generation uh, in our company. Um, and the, the roots actually go back to, um, you know, when grandpa actually was uh, uh, exiting World War II. He was uh, a member of what it was uh, at the time known as the Army Air Corps. And the Army Air Corps was the precursor to uh, the Air Force. Grandpa flew on B-17 bombers. He was a navigator, uh, which meant that he was responsible for making sure that the aircraft got to their destination and that the uh, folks could drop the bombs where uh, they were meant to. Um, and so he flew many missions out of, uh, out of the UK, uh, over occupied France. Um, and uh, actually, he, the, I mean, the, the crazy story is that he was actually shot down uh, on his final mission. Uh, so he and all of the crew of his uh, aircraft had to parachute out of the airplane. Um, he literally had to jump through uh, the bomb bay doors while the aircraft was in the air. That's the only way out of the airplane. Oh, my goodness. Half the crew was uh, captured by the Nazis um, and grandpa and uh, the other half of the crew were rescued by the group that is now, um, you know, was then and was known as the French resistance. They helped smuggle him uh, throughout France. He was way up in the northern part of France uh, near a town called Nancy, France. Uh, The the French folks picked him up there and uh, smuggled him across a variety of checkpoints all the way to the southern border uh, of Spain where he walked across the Pyrenees mountains and, uh, you know, ended up in a Spanish prison, but that was a a better place to be than a concentration camp. Sure. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So when he came back, uh, you know, eventually the, the, all the papers cleared, he got back to the United States. He was debriefed in Washington, DC, and then went on some mandatory R and R, which put him on a train uh, to go all the way to the West coast where the, uh, you know, the fun was happening on the beach Uh, during that, that, during that ride, he, uh, was in the dining car. Uh, the you know you used to just you took all your meals on the train and took a couple of days and uh, the Mater D you know which was normal I guess for old you know timey trains uh, mm-hmm. asked him you know if he was having uh, dinner for two tonight and you know he looked at him kind of weird but was like rolling with it a little bit and looked to you know, kind of looked behind him and there was a nice looking lady there and he said yeah two sounds good and uh, so he. Uh, then met uh, this woman named Nancy, uh, who 
as you know, the story wouldn't be any fun to tell if it wasn't my grandma, uh-huh. um, but they met on the train. Uh, they stopped in St. Louis. She was heading to Washington University in St. Louis uh, to be uh, to do her studies to become a nurse. Uh, grandpa actually grew up in uh, a little south of St. Louis. Um, so he went home to his family, but uh, got to know, you know, got to know grandma over the course of about a week. He was there before he did R&R, came back through and uh, and they were married within about three months. Uh, they got married down in New Orleans. He was restationed down there with some administrative stuff. They got married and uh, and started their family in New Orleans before coming to St. Louis. And, you know, the 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 mythology is that like grandma's family actually uh, had home cleaning services when, you know, they were actually from more of a a mainland Europe. And when their family came across uh, to the United States, they uh, actually did high-end home cleaning in Washington, DC. And so his, you know, grandpa and grandma were trying to decide what sort of business they wanted to start. And, um, you know, just had kind of decided they wanted to settle in in St. Louis. And uh, ultimately they got this, this idea that there was this new type of machine that was coming out um, that you, you actually, you would put it on a trailer and it allowed you to clean rugs inside of people's homes. Mm-hmm. And so in the forties, there was no, um, you know, there was no wall to wall carpeting like that, that really hadn't come to fruition yet. And, and so really everybody had rugs in their house. And normally what you have to do, you have to clear out all your furniture. You have to roll these rugs up and you'd send them into a, a, a rug cleaning uh, facility to get them cleaned. And, um, at this time was when the first, uh, what, what really is known now as, as a truck mount type system, uh, we're starting to come out. So grandma and grandpa put their savings into one, uh, hooked it up to the family station wagon and began towing that around St. Louis. And grandpa, you know, started with the first door to door rug cleaning, uh, in St. Louis. And that's the, that's the, that's the origin of, uh, uh, you know, our services, right. It started with that in-home rug cleaning and, um, and really evolved uh, over the course of many years into, you know, we ended up having a rug cleaning plant, wall-to-wall carpeting. Uh, we did some drapery cleaning for a while. Uh, and then, you know, like many companies uh, like us in the 80s and in uh, 90s began doing fire damage uh, cleanup and water damage cleanup and mold remediation and, and, constru- and, and construction. That's an amazing story. I love that you know that many details about your grandparents and your grandfather's story and all that. And people don't always know that many details of a story. And that's, a, that's an awesome story. So I'm glad that you shared all of that. I love it. So what has helped Woodard stay viable across 75 years? Obviously there's been some evolution with services and stuff like that, some generational leadership changes. So what does that look like to stay viable and competitive across seven decades, almost eight now? Yeah, I think the, uh, um, the, the way that I think about it is, and it brings it back to really just um, kind of a couple of three kind of core things that we have done over and over and over again, right? And um, the, the first one is is service. Um, you know, the idea that we have to serve others in order to be able to stay viable is, is at the core of the things that we do each and every day. Uh, my grandpa started by serving the community uh, just by going door to door, right? And um, over time, grandma extended that into the community by serving uh, different uh, community organizations, whether that's through volunteer time, um, contributing our services, um, or connecting with churches and other things around the area so that we could um, extend that service out beyond uh, Woodard. Uh, that continued on into serving in different types of things, right? Our customers said, hey, we need help with, with these things. And we uh, maintained that kind of that servant mindset to be able to go out and say, Hey, we need to, if we want to stay viable, we have to listen and we have to go serve. And that has, um, really, you know, has solidified into a core really. I mean, we, we think about it and talk about it as a core value, but like it is about how we behave. We serve each other when we're, um, need help across departments or across teams. We serve our customers every single day and all of the services that we provide, um, and then we serve the community in, uh, with a variety of different charitable, um, you know, organizations that we support and volunteer our time to. Um, the second thing is uh, learning. Uh, if if we are going to stay viable, we have to go learn something. And we look at learning something every single day. That's really our benchmark. What we want to do is be able to maybe that's learning about the services that we provide Maybe that's about learning uh, uh, about uh, you know different client client needs. Uh, maybe that's just learning about how to 
you know, do a Zoom meeting in a little different way or build a different spreadsheet or use a truck mount in a little, little bit different way or learning a different skill that you could apply to a different service. And so, um, you know, encouraging our people to learn on their own, whether that's reading books or going to classes or going out and visiting folks in the industry um, or just being able to listen to each other so that we can learn a little something from each other is, is kind of the second thing that I think when, when I think about how are we going to, how have we and how will we stay viable is we've got to keep learning. Um, and then I think the last one is really just this idea that we do need to have a kind of a benchmark or, or hold ourselves accountable for doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of times when we're, you know, whether it's in business or with, you know, when you have coworkers or employees or, you know, or you're dealing with insurance companies um, and th- there's just a lot of uh, different interests and people in that, that, that we can have to connect and we really have to be focused on trying to do the right thing in each of those situations. Um, there's, there's opportunities for a lot of disagreement and there's a lot of opportunities to have things not go great. And, um, you know, being just kind of being able to take a step back and say, okay, what, what is the right thing to do in this case? Um, really, I, you know, I look at our employees kind of as a first thing and then looking towards our clients as number two and, and, um, you know, I think if we do those two things, then Woodard as a whole will end up doing the right thing and, and being able to thrive into the future. Okay. Um, so there, generational leadership change is kind of a big topic in the industry right now. Baby boomers are phasing out and there's Gen X, millennials, Gen Z. There's a lot going on in that shift now. So I'm a little curious if you're willing to share how the generational leadership sh- changes have gone in Woodard. Like, did you guys know ahead of time that like you were going to be coming in as president after your dad, I'm assuming? And did he know that he was stepping in after grandpa? Were there other siblings in here? Like, how did all of that work out? as you went through generations? Yeah. Well, I can tell you the, the, what happened with my grandparents. I know the thing that happened. I, I have no personal experience of why, what the planning was and any of that. Um, but my, my, my grandparents had six kids. Um, and ultimately two of them, my dad and his brother, George, uh, were partners in our business. So they transitioned the, the business from grandma and grandpa to, uh, you know, ultimately George and Charlie, my dad, and uh, that happened in the early '80s. Um, the other, uh, the other four siblings all had different interests and went off and did different things in different industries. Um, the so I don't, I can't speak to how smoothly or, uh, you know, <laughs> nope. I, I don't okay. know. I do know that Dad was the president and leader of the company as soon as they transitioned. Right, okay. so there wasn't. Um, you know, how exactly that was decided or how those things happen. I'm not exactly sure. Um, But dad took over as the leader of the organization, um, you know, when that generational transition happened. Um, From the the next, you know, the next time we did this, which was really, it was only five years ago, right? Um, We, I had been working in the business um, for, you know, about seven, eight years. um, And um, you know, when I, when I ultimately bought the business, it was a couple of years before that, that we actually transitioned to leadership of the company. Um, and, you know, frankly, like there's not a, it's not a necessarily a huge, uh, long story, but, um, I did, my dad actually did have, um, a little bit of a health scare. Right. And so part of our, you know, we were, uh, we were planning that I would be ultimately leading the company in a few years. Um, but that was accelerated and really, you know, we, we kind of did a dry run, uh, because dad had uh, to take a little break from the business and get healthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so fortunately, he was able to you know, come through that in a, in a, in a positive way. Um, and he and mom are, are doing really, really well right now. Um, but that, that was kind of the, 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 the short-term catalyst that caused us to act. Um, but really, you know, I've got a bunch of cousins. You know, there's a lot of Woodard cousins. And frankly, I think all of them have worked in the business. And, you know, because of you know, one thing or another, the, uh, they had other interests, they were good at other things. And, you know, ultimately, it, it was only me uh, in the business when we when we were making the transition. Um, and so, you know, we did that over the course of, you know, two years for the leadership change. And then, you know, after two years, uh, we worked with, uh, you know, our, um, our, uh, our council and in, 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 in the, the, 
the accounting folks and, and figured out the best way to, to do it. I think, you know, that's different for different types of businesses. And, uh, but we were able to make that uh, happen in a good way for, I think, for the business, uh, for our customers, for sure, and our employees. Uh, what so would you I, say is one of the most memorable Woodard jobs from over the years, whether it's your time or something you heard about before your time? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> what would be a good one to share? Um, you know, I... I it, I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say, if you want to ponder it, I'll come back to it. You can ponder it. So, um, so what would you say you're most proud of? I think I know the answer based on what you've said so far. Now, what are you most proud of from Woodard's legacy so far through the last 75 years? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I feel like my dad, my grandparents originally, and then grandpa or my, my dad in particular, um, they took our business and said, hey, you know what, we're going to do something a little different with this business. Instead of only saying we're going to, you know, we're going to go out and um, just do a bunch of work. And, um, you know, it's really just a, a family business. They, they, they kind of said, hey, you know what, the family is important, but we actually want to create a business that, um, that, that, that supports and is additive to a whole bunch of different family members. And so the combined thing here is this twofold thing of, we have a place where people can have their career. We have a place where they can support their family in a really, really positive way. Um, and we have a business that helps a whole lot of people all over St. Louis. And so, you know, we kind of took this, uh, this, this kind of family operation and really turned it into a business that supports a whole lot of people. Um, and I, you know, for me, that is the thing. Like the you know, doing doing big jobs and doing all the work that we do is really for me secondary to creating an environment where people can uh, where people can grow, where people can contribute to their family and contribute to um, you know contribute to other people's lives in a way that's really impactful. Um, you know, if you, if you, if you've spent any time in our industry, you know, that it's, it's messy, it's dirty, it's hard, it's labor intensive. It, you do it all. I mean, it's just, it's relentless. And um, to be able to create a place where folks can, you know, operate in that environment, but then feel really good about what they're doing afterwards. Um, I think that, I mean, that, that, that for me is the, is the thing that feels the best. Um, I do think that grandma also left kind of uh, a, you know, kind of an expectation when she left the business that said, hey, you know what? It's great that you're helping your clients. It's great that you helping the people of Woodard have, uh, have good, uh, you know, a, a good job. Uh, but, but you better not forget about the community, right? You better not forget about the people that are out there that may not uh, you know, be as fortunate or have what they need. And so make sure that you, that you have some structures and you have a, the ability to support folks outside of the company as well. Um, Cause that, that really is that the reputation that we have in the community is, I think it's strong because of her, you know, her kind of expectation that, you know, if you, if you are, if you are successful, you really need to share that with, uh, with people uh, around you and, and that are in the community. You need to be, you need to be contributing to the community as well. Sure. Well, I know that you guys go beyond even just your local community. I mean, you're involved in the RA and I'm guessing some other things on a larger industry scale and giving back in those ways. So what are some, what's some of the value that you find in being involved across the industry as well, not just in your local community? Yeah. It, I mean, for us, it most of the time comes back to kind of that second thing that's core for us that I was talking about. And that, that really is learning. Um, the, the idea that, you know, one, you know, learning is something uh, that to me is always additive, right? So no matter how big the company is, no matter how short a time they've been around or how long a time they've been around, if you can go into another company um, and have your mind open enough to be able to kind of see what they're doing, uh, there is always a nugget for you to take away. There are always is something that you could do a little bit better or something that, that uh, you haven't looked at the same, same way as someone else. And so when we part, you know, we participated in, 
frankly, as many organizations and companies and groups of restoration people as we possibly can, mm-hmm. um, it, we're doing it with that in mind, that no matter how who we're connecting to, who's there, we uh, encourage our people and really, you know, kind of, um, you know, train by example by bringing all different types of people from Woodard into those spaces to say, hey, you know what, we're, we're, we're going to learn something here. And in order to do that, you sometimes you sometimes you might have to dig a little. Other times it just hits you in the face, um, and it's it's pretty obvious. But it always takes an open mind. It always takes being able to say, "Hey, I don't actually know all the answers. I am not nece- I'm not the best at this thing. There is there is something to learn." And being able to show up with a little humility to to kind of hear from other folks, even if they have a lot less experience than you, um, kind of is that important thing. And um, you know that that is endeared like. We've gotten really, we've created really good friends in the industry because of that, that how we show up in that, that way. And I think we've been able to help some folks out, um, you know, as they've been coming into the industry, I think we've been able to contribute over the years. Um, and, I, and I think all of it uh, comes from, you know, I, I got to believe, right? Like that is grandma and grandpa's example that, that started that, right? They were, they were among the first people that started NIRC years and years ago, right? That is the organization that ultimately has become RIA. Um, so we, you know, they, they helped the, they, they kind of laid some of the foundation of that. And I, you know, I think it's a good story to at least say that, you know, that was done with some humility and that was done with the future in mind. And that was done with kind of this idea that if you, if you put a little bit in, you, you know, that, that it's going to, it's going to grow. It's going to be additive and you're going to, uh, be able to to have good relationships that come out of that 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 ultimately I think will will serve you really really well. I think we've right. done a, a big uh, uh, we we've received a lot of, of you know a lot of value from from that contributions that so many people before me have made. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Woodard has a great legacy. That's awesome. Okay, so I know um, that you're not keeping the celebrations for the 75th anniversary just to yourself. The community is going to be involved, right? So tell me a little bit about what these big celebrations look like. Yeah, so we are, um, we're, we're really dividing the biggest celebrations into two, two uh, kind of two events. Uh, so first, uh, it is the event that is open to our clients in the community. So the folks that we know outside of Woodard, um, that have been, uh, you know, that have that have, add, that have kind of added something to our success, um, or that we uh, help support. Um, we're inviting all of those folks into our our new facility uh, to be able to, you know, really just have fun, have a party, um, and kind of see what we're up to. Um, I don't know if it necessarily has, you know, that we've, that we've shared it broadly, but we, um, uh, we we've spent the last about eighteen months building out a new facility for the vast majority of our operations. And so we've, we, we moved from uh, uh, three, three buildings, our main offices, a fire restoration content cleaning center and warehouse, and then a uh, logistical operation that supports our water damage and, and, and carpet cleaning folks. We moved all of those facilities into one, one building. Um, and so we built out a, about 115,000 square feet uh, to support all of these different parts of the operation. And so we've, uh, we've, we opened the operational parts in December of last year, and then we just opened the office in the last month. And, and so we've got everybody, uh, all those folks in one spot, and we're going to be opening that up to uh, celebrate, uh, you know, really celebrate 75 years of, 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 of success, uh, but then also looking at, hey, w- what that has allowed us to do is build this, um, you know, build this facility and this operation that I think will be able to support uh, the community and and a lot of our clients uh, going forward. Okay. Second event we're doing is really internal. It's the family party, you know. That is, you know, bringing in some some bands, bringing in lots of like bounce houses, uh, lots of events for the kids, and really inviting all of the uh, employees and their family members of all ages. Uh, to come in and, and really have kind of a, uh, you know, in a sense, a private party for the, uh, for the Woodard family. Um, and so I, I think we did invite a lot of the Woodard, you know, my actual Woodard family members, <laughs> uh, but really it's for the employees of Woodard and, you know, that employee family that really is the folks that, uh, you know, that go out and, 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 and serve, right. And, and are able to help so many people get back to their lives. 
Yep. Okay. I love it. Okay. So before we wrap it up, do you have anything else you want to add? And I'm curious what you think the next 75 years looks like at Woodard. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, even know that you can answer that, but. Right. Right. I mean, I don't even, I mean, I can't even fathom um, asking my grandpa 75 years ago, like, what do you think Woodard's going to look like in 75 years? And he's like, oh, well, I think we're going to have a a fleet of like 150 vehicles and we'll have a hundred thousand square foot facility. Like, I mean, like that's not, I don't think he, I would be shocked if he had that, uh, you know, that, that amount of uh, vision and foresight. I, maybe I'll just rephrase that. Like I definitely don't have that. (laughs) 75 years is uh, a, a kind of an unfathomable amount of time. When I think about the future, when, you know, 18 months ago, you think about like, could you have really predicted what we would be doing uh, yeah. right now? Um, so I, I think the thing that I would, um, you know, I think, I think I would kind of sum it up this, like right now we're on a, um, uh, the thing we're like all working together for is really to make this promise to our customers that we're going to show up with the most capable people that we can. And that is across all the, all of the services that we provide, the folks that come out to your home or business, they're going to be the most capable and we're going to continue. Like that's like an aspirational thing, right? I don't, I'm, I'm not sure where we are across everything, the most capable, but that's what we want to be able to promise. And so we're going to continue to go out into the industry to learn new things. We're going to continue to connect with folks to be able to say, Hey, how do we answer this question? What do we need to do next to be the most capable? And if we can do that over and over again across all the different uh, customers that we serve, um, we're going to be able to get to like our current, like, you know, our current big goal is we want to help a million people get back to their lives. And we've been, we've been kind of counting that for about five years, right? And so we're about a quarter of the way there, which means we still got, we still got a long way to go, right? Um, But the thing that kind of ties us all together is that we just, we want to help people, right? Folks have had a bad day in a variety of different ways, whether that is just like the dogs had an accident on the carpet, right? Or like the whole roof is off, right? All the things in between there, we feel we can come and help you get back to the life that you want to live without these disasters that are happening, right? And if we help a million people get back to their lives, I'm going to be a pretty happy guy, right? And so I don't think that's going to take us 75 years, no, um, I do think it's a pretty big goal for our, you know, kind of our, uh, in a sense, you know, small, mid-sized company uh, in the middle of the country. Um, but it, it, it does uh, bring a lot of people together at Woodard. Um, and it does serve, I think, the community in kind of a way that is, uh, you know, it's meaningful and impactful to me and our family, um, you know, and the people of Woodard. So I think we'll keep doing that. I think that's the, that's the, you know, then the, when I look out as far as I can see, whether that's, you know, a couple, five, 10 years, yep. um, th- that really is the, 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 that can, you know, and think about it. Like, so that is the thing that connects us back with grandma and grandpa. Right. So I, I don't, I don't, again, I don't think necessarily grandpa had this grand vision. Right. But at the end of the day, he only got to come back to start the business because the people in France helped him. Mm-hmm. Right. He had a pretty bad day. Right. Jumping out of an airplane, you know, engines on fire, right? Like bad day. And the people of France, they helped him. And so, you know, I I think about him coming back into St. Louis and saying, hey, you know, we could open a little shop, right? Or we could go serve the community, right? And he ultimately and grandma chose to serve. And, you know, I think that I think that that is meaningful. So, you know, the exact what we do in 75 years, maybe totally different, but I do believe, you know, the service element and why we're doing it so that we can help people will, will kind of, uh, that'll outlast, I think all of us, at least that's my hope. Yes. Yes. I love it. All right. So for those of you who are listening, be sure to go to cnrmagazine.com because I will have pictures and stuff after the anniversary celebration. I'm not able to be there, but I've been told that I will get pictures and will post as much as I can to help you guys celebrate from afar. So Justin, congratulations on 75 years. And thank you so much for chatting with me. I hope you have an awesome rest of your day. Beautiful. Michelle, thanks so much for having us. Um, we, you know, I can't wait for the party this weekend and I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to get you some good shots. I love it. For more Restoration Today, visit our website, cnrmagazine.com.
or find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts.